gently. That's your Lord. My instructions were to speak gently when I spoke. That's your Lord. Amen. Now to bring you in. Take a seat. Now listen close to me to what I'm about to share with you. Because you probably have not understood it at this level. And I want every Messiah I can get it. When Isaiah, which is the song that Jerina is singing, you cleansed my lips right before I died. That's a passage in a song that's somewhat difficult to understand. It doesn't make sense to our minds because when we hear die, we think done, over with, gone. That's not what Isaiah was experiencing in heaven. It was supposed to be me. I used to read in scripture where if the king didn't extend the scepter, he would die. Esther had to have the scepter extended to her if she went into the presence of the king uninvited. And if he didn't extend that scepter, she died. Now the scepter was the full symbol of his rule as king. We're going to get to that in a moment. But what that song said was this. Isaiah was in heaven in the presence of the Holy Ghost. And he was not holy. And his flesh was literally dying. while standing there in the presence of a holy God. And the holy God had a solution for him. Take a fiery coal off the altar and go put it on his lips. Oh, so that everything he speaks will come through my holiness. Oh. And it took away the dead. And he was able to stand in the presence of the Holy God. <laughs> That's what's coming. That's the training ground. When we pick up that cross, it helps us stand in the presence of the Holy God. When we make Jesus Lord, it helps us stand in the presence of the Holy God. So we've got one more to go. And Betty, I'm going to ask you to stop and go have a seat so you can receive this fully. Amen. Not labeling. Bless the Lord. I'm going to trust that the Lord will continue to anoint our ears so that we are able to hear what I'm about to share with you. I was somewhere recently, I don't remember the example, so I can't give it to you, but God the Father was emphasizing for me to pray exactly what I had heard. Yeah, but what was it about? It was about someone that had a situation. Oh. Uh, oh, yes, I remember. Oh, oh. Uh, we had someone. We're getting calls. And if I pray what God the Father drops into me to pray the way he instructs me to pray, it comes to pass. And it's live on the line where death wants to claim. And the Lord will speak, I'll do it. Now from that moment on, I have to walk in faith and hold faith. I cannot let it go. I have to stand with the person. I cannot let doubt come in. No, that's a fear. Sorry. I have to stand before the Lord and what he has said and then it comes to pass and we're seeing the miraculous just off of calls coming in. 
That is the place every saint wants to be. Where they pray something and it comes to pass. But it's not in the words that we pray. It's not even some form of a declaration that we decree. It's in hearing and obeying exactly as God says. It's letting His will take over and you stand by faith. That's where the key to this miraculous world is. So what I'm about to tell you, don't get taken back by it, but get prepared to repent of it out of that softened heart that God was speaking about. Jesus sat down. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. I hear the Lord telling me to slap this thing up here, so I'm just going to obey. Jesus sat down as king. He sat down as a king. God the King and instructions come from the throne of the King. Now the Lord is the only one who can do this where he can give a command which must be obeyed and give you the grace to fail in the obedience. He's the only one who can do that. However, when Jesus is speaking instructions, he is not speaking as Lord. Oh, get a hold of this. Because if he's speaking as Lord, you're still learning how to obey the scripture. You see it? When he speaks as king, it's a done thing as long as you obey your king. The reason, the reason we don't see the miraculous more in the body is because Jesus is not king to that situation. We think if we just pray the right words, It'll never come by praying the right words. It'll have to be you standing before your king by faith. And then the miracles will come. Did you hear that revelation now? Jesus sat down not as Lord. He is Lord. Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of Lords. He sat down, but he did not sit down as Lord. He sat down as King. Oh. We don't understand. Once the King says a thing, there's no argument. There's no Supreme Court to take it to. <laughs> there's no appealing the verdict. There's no changing his mind. All of that is in his kingship, God the king. But when he speaks from his throne as king to your life, you will see extraordinary miracles. Get them going. And isn't that where we want to go? We want to see the extraordinary miracles of the Lord. We can't create it out of our imagination. That's us in charge. Extraordinary miracles is God in charge. And he has to speak, and we have to stand by faith because we heard from our king. Our king's rules works against most of our Americanisms. I said that right, Americanism. So all the 
things that we have in our American freedom. You know, I have the freedom to only go to a church service that has air conditioning. Think of it. How deep our comfort is when we think that unless there's air conditioning, I'm not going. We don't even question it. We don't want to think it further. If there's no air conditioning, I'm not going. Listen, if Jesus as king said to you to go, you go. Because there is no alternative to the voice of a king. So then, if you have not understood how to obey your king, and you want to stand before him and say, Jesus, I repent, Lord, for not obeying your kingship as much as I should. Stand. Keep your soft heart before the Lord. It's not a big thing. Just tell him. Just tell him, Jesus, you're the king. And I repent to you for not always yielding to your kingship. In your name, Jesus, cleanse me by your blood in this area. I make you king this morning, again, afresh and anew. In Jesus' holy name. Bless the Lord. When you're done, you may sit. God is not after 30 minute prayers. I've been in the presence of the Lord before in His glory. And it'll be like three hours, and we'll think it's three minutes. God the Father owns time and does with it marvelous things. Too marvelous almost to behold. Look at this soft, wonderful. We made it, y'all. And we might have a couple more training rounds, but look at what we made. Because we did not put the hard time there. Ha! That's right. We let them play in the globe. Sure as I said all of that, now we gotta have patience and endurance. Again. Bless the Lord. But I want our children to be raised in the glory. I remember being five years old. We got three more years to go for that. I remember being five and sensing the presence of the Lord in the sanctuary. As the Holy Ghost. Sensing God's holiness at age five. And the safest thing to do was just lay my head right down on the bench and go to sleep. That was my escapism from God's holiness. But I also, at some point, couldn't get away. And I went to the altar and gave my heart to Jesus at age five. Huh. I don't know how long it lasted, and I remember giving my heart to Jesus at age eight. <laughs> and I think that lasted about a week. I remember talking to myself, walking the sidewalk. This is going to last. Last time I did it. This is going to make it. I got to make it two weeks. I'm going to go two weeks. <laughs> Bless the Lord. Well, we have been, would you stretch your hands out, the tithes and offerings? You are faithful, and I just want to bless you. Father, in as much as you've made me steward, Lord, Lord, set man among peers, Lord, Father, an under rower, shepherd on your ship, Jesus, to get us home. Now I just bless every faithful heart who gives unto you, Lord God. Their bond will be filled. Lord, the curse will be stopped. The canker worm and the palmer worm will have holes refilled right in front of our eyes. In Jesus' holy name. I bless Messiah's faithful hearts in Jesus' name. The Lord has
has had a at home group start a series that the Lord allows us to keep up with it on how to be a team with God the Father. How to be on a God team with God. God. You and him are God team. And that's a very positively wonderful thing. Though it will take us picking up our cross, obeying the scripture, Jesus is Lord, and obeying the king by faith at a kingship level. It'll take that. And those instructions are all in the scriptures. But this morning, God the Father was very specific. The Lord gives us so much revelation in a week's time. I have to hear from him what message he wants. Because it's possible to go in several directions. And this morning, the Lord wanted me to go, instructed me, to go out of 2 Timothy, the third chapter, beginning with the first verse about difficult times. Now we also had a revelatory moment when God the Father was taking us in the foreshadowing truths of what he intends to fill up to let a thing come to fullness before he pours. And we got through laying a foundation for that and I'm praying that you will pay attention to the Lord Holy Spirit as he continuously enlarges your understanding of that. That's what any word in the pulpit should always do. It should just begin. And then you and Lord Holy Spirit continue. Always. But this morning, we're going to take a look at something that God the Father tolerates while it fills up. God the Father doesn't fill it up. Man does. But God the Father sees it and prophesies it to us. And we are in the foothold of these verses in 2 Timothy about difficult times coming. How many of us think some of that might already be here. We're seeing the rise of difficult times coming. But realize this, verse 1, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Now I want to share with you that we're going to see in the next verses where these difficult times come from. Interestingly enough, they all come, all of them, all the difficult times that are going to come on the earth, come as a result of wrong choices of the heart. I want to say it again. All the difficult times are going to come as a result of wrong choices of the heart. And I hear the Lord reminding me once more to tell you that he instructed me to give this message this morning. So then, someone has a choice to consecrate their lives to the Lord, but instead, they make a wrong choice of the heart, and that wrong choice keeps getting made and multiplies itself, and we wind up with verse 2. Now, it's almost unfathomable, almost unfathomable to note 
that this verse is not a description of the world. Verse 2 is not a description of the world, but of the church. Now keep that in mind, that this is a description of the church. And as we go on down, somewhere around verse 5 and forward, we'll see that. For men will be lovers of self. Somewhere around verse 4, when it begins to culminate, we'll start throwing some one-liners at it, but I'm just going to read. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good. Now we're going to pick up in verse 4, because I didn't want to go through every single one of those, maybe at another time. We're going to take verse 4, treacherous. When someone is treacherous, nothing is trustworthy. You extend trust especially in a pastoral setting, you may, none of y'all be guilty of this now, but you extend trust, and instead you get a Korah. You get an Absalom. Someone that wants to overthrow you. Treacherous. In the house. Jermaine and I have experienced a great deal of that. One day there will be several, several hundred men and women who will know that they were called to be where you will be. Hundreds will come knowing that they should have stayed the journey because God has selected us for a certain glory. And when it comes, there will be hearts that probably will let me just walk back in and step right back in where I was. Sorry. Can't happen. You've missed years of training that would have prepared you. Let me just repent of what I did. Please do. I will forgive you. But you still are lacking. Treacherous. You extend trust, you get a Korah and an Absalom. Someone who tries to steal the church. Someone who stabs you in the back. Oh my, treacherous. Reckless. Now when this is in the house, please remember this. This is in the house. This is not the description of the world. That's what's so sad about these verses. This is in the house. Reckless. When someone is reckless, nothing is thought through with balance. It's just reactionary. Decisions that endanger get carried out because it's on the spot. Just make a decision and roll with it. And it's reckless. No seekings of the Lord here whatsoever. No yieldedness. So then, if something is completed, now, how many of y'all have been handsome or beautiful in your life? Sally, raise your hand. Raise your hand, Sally. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Sally was a beautiful English girl. And Handsomeness or beauty can go to your head, but it doesn't have to be flesh. You can be overly abundantly proud of your IQ. You can do this next thing any numbers of ways, but conceited. Everything about the vain side of self, conceited. In the house. I 
I am the greatest praise and worship leader on the planet. Oh yeah, well you might have told God. Lovers, but lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, motivated by pleasure. So then, verse 5 sums it, holding to a form of godliness. Let that settle in that every single thing we just read above is describing the house. Oh my. Now there is a solution. I'll read it again at the end. But here is the solution to all of that. And don't think you aren't going to have to persevere and endure and have patience and love and faith and kindness. Oh yeah, all of the above. But here's the solution. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord upon you. Oh. But look at what you're going to work with. In the last day, this is what you're going to work with. Oh my. Holding to a form of godliness. There's going to be a claim to Christianity. But they will have never allowed the work of the cross. Aren't you glad you prayed that prayer this morning? The cross, the Lord, the King. They're so simple. It's just bowing your head before the Lord, asking Him to forgive you, get up, run again. Carry the sword of repentance with you always. So then, verse 6, I'll go to verse 5 and finish it. Holy to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. That's not allowing the work of the cross. The cross has power to redeem. The blood has power to to redeem. Covenanting with God has power to redeem. Now scripture says something pretty interesting. Avoid such men as these. That does not mean don't let the love of the Lord be a witness. But it means if you trust them, listen closely to what I'm going to say. If you trust them, seeing that kind of fruit on the vine, that kind of works showing up on the tree. If you trust them, you're about to take a fall with them. The scripture says, the Lord, don't covenant with any of that. Be friendly, but know what level of friendship you can have. Very important. So then, verse 6 gets worse. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, way down in sins, led on by various impulses. Now the weight of this scripture is actually coming to the man. Why? Because he's the predator. He spots the weak woman and preys on her. But does the woman have to be weak? No, she does not. 
there are godly women who will be mightily used of God. In the last days, saith God, I will pour forth of my spirit and your sons and your daughters. So then, for among them are those who enter in the households and captivate weak women. In the house, expect multiplied affairs. Sexual liaison, promiscuous sensuality with men and women guilty in sensual sin. Expect it. Scripture says, if Scripture says, it will be. I'm not making something up. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to make that up. But scripture says this will be in the house. Know the ground that you are on and know who you are fellowshipping with. So then, since there's an entry into a household, there's a destruction, if there is any family, of the destruction of the family unit happening. All of these various impulses are instantaneous yieldings to a demon. Demon comes and whispers, there's no resistance, bam, you just go with the demon. Had to watch that last time. Last time, that was God corrected me. Y'all remember that? I did something too much and my iPad fell off the backside. So, bless the Lord. Yieldings to the demonic temptations. Verse 7. This one you've got to really get a hold of because it's everywhere already. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now this is, I want to read it one more time, always learning. Such a pursuit to learn, to learn. To learn, to learn, thinking that that is where it's at. Always learning. And never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So from hell, at the church, to deceive the church, will be a deception in position to deceive that says... I have more knowledge than you. How many of y'all have ever spoken to someone and they were just filled with knowledge? But that's not where it's at. The drive, this is a description of the house in the end days. The drive the knowledge will be bowed to, honored, lifted up. Those able to quote topical wisdom, topical wisdom will be seen as mighty and mightier. Reading a book will be substituted for an experiential walk that is trained by heaven with heaven's backing. I want to pay attention to the person who has heaven backing them up. I don't want to pay attention to anything else. I don't
don't want to pay attention to knowledge and the pursuit of learning. There's deception for the house in that. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The pursuit of knowledge is never the right direction. A pursuit of wisdom is. And with all you're getting, get understanding how to apply that wisdom. And wisdom is nothing more than the way God sees it. If you see it the way God the Father sees it, you have wisdom. So then, I want to just take a moment and come up to speed with the New Living Translation. We've covered about seven verses. I just want to cover those seven verses in the New Living Translation. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times, for people will love only themselves and their money. We need to start at the presidency and come down the hill on that one. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. They are the kind who work their way into people's homes and win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Such women are forever following new teachings. Oh, wow. But they are never able to understand the truth. These teachers oppose the truth just as Jans and Jambres opposed Moses. Now, if you were to try to hunt up Jans and Jambres, you'd have to go outside of Scripture, because that's the only place they're mentioned. And what they actually were was Pharaoh's magicians. When Moses came with the power of God, humble before the Lord, waiting on God to speak, do this, do it this way. Moses did not make a move just like Jesus till God spoke. That's what you want with your exploit. That's what you want with your extraordinary miracle. The king speaks to you, and then you obey. And whatever you do, don't claim the king spoke to you when he didn't, and it's your imagination. You're driving yourself away from the king when you do that. How do you know it's the king? Just be humble before him. Just walk in humility. The humble will be exalted. The exploits are for those whom God exalts. He'll do it. You won't do it out of self-strength. You won't do it out of much knowledge. You'll do it out of a humble walk with God. Tell him that. We're the Lord. That's where we come from. He'll give you an assignment. Tell him he'll back you up. You're the real. So then, these teachers oppose the truth just as Jairus and Jambres opposed Moses. They have depraved minds and a counterfeit faith. A counterfeit faith in the house. But they won't get away with this for long. Someday everyone will recognize what fools they are, just as with Jairus and Jambres. There are a couple of foolish people in Scripture. Kings who had God with them 
an experiential heaven backing and then did the natural even though heaven had just trained them in the spirit and they went for the natural and God had to let the spanking come sometimes costing them their life the guy who stood before Elijah's little hill and told him the king of Israel says Get your butt down here, prophet. Oh my. 102 piles of ash. That second captain is one of the dumbest people. But there's another dumb one, and that's Pharaoh himself. Saw 10 miraculous moments where the hand of God judged and kept increasing the judgment. And now he's standing at a Red Sea and seeing Israel going through it and thinks he can. There have been others, the Philistines that thought that they could handle a holy God without holiness. See, that's what Isaiah ran into. Isaiah ran into what Jesus was showing me on the shepherd's rest mountain where he was with three angels and in front of Jesus was a round circle. I think it was about 20 and a half feet wide in diameter. My, you can't tell, can't tell dimensions in the spirit that easily. And the Lord knew. I was looking at it. The word was not spoken. Jesus didn't open his mouth, didn't see his lips. He just spoke to me spirit to spirit. As he knew, I was wondering why that circle was burnt and everywhere else there was grass but where that circle was completely burnt and the Lord answered me and it was out of his kingship Jesus is king and in essence what the Lord dropped in my heart is nothing lives in my presence unless I allow it that's what Isaiah experienced he was suddenly thrust in the presence of a holy God without holiness. That's why I tell you on the truth. I cut up with you, but it's true. There will be people in heaven, and they could spend their thousand years out in the field of flowers learning how to bloom, because they wouldn't learn how to pick up their cross down here. You can't skip any bit of God in heaven. There is no free pass to go enjoy our comfort zone heaven. It does not exist. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, the great I am, you can handle it. You can be that without getting consumed. That's a little different glimpse of heaven. So, so then, verse 8, are y'all hanging with me? Do y'all recognize this is the word of the Lord to us? This is training ground for what's coming. We need this word. This is the word that God said to speak this morning. I was prepared to go in a different direction. God wasn't. Just as Jans and Jambres opposed, there are going to be opposition teachers. Think about being an opposition teacher. All teaching should agree in the house. Different subjects, they should all agree. There should be nothing of man in any teaching. All teaching should agree. Every scripture agrees with every scripture. There's no disagreement with scripture. I train you in this all the time by telling you 
No doctrine is complete and correct if there's a single scripture that says different than that doctrine. All scripture agrees with all scripture. Now we can find a scripture that is different than the doctrines that we embrace. That doctrine is not yet complete. It does not mean that it's so far off that we want to throw it in the trash. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Amen. But when a doctrine is complete, it will agree with every scripture in scripture. There will not be a single scripture that will go in a different direction than that doctrine. Oh my. You and I have a covenantal letter from Genesis to Revelation that invites us out of love. It's an invitational letter to come and be commanded. Isn't that wild? Only God can do that. Please come out of my love for you and be commanded. And we have to choose to be commanded. And when we choose to be commanded, now we're choosing Jesus as king. So then, you need to probably just catch a glimpse of this, that all opposition teaching, all opposition teachers, all opposition teaching. Now, am I quoting the scriptures? I am. All opposition teaching comes from tickling ears desire. If the ear did not want to be tickled, there'd be no teaching that would tickle it. And when there's a tickling ear, there may have been a grand and glorious walk with God up until a single moment when you turn to hearing what you wanted. That's why scripture says, he that has an ear, let him hear. Till that moment, they had an ear. But at the next step, they've got to hear again by submitting. You can always turn away from hearing God at any time. But they will not make further progress for their folly, their foolishness will be obvious to all. Now that's one of the glorious moments at the head and the body. When everybody who thinks that they are somebody suddenly realizes they are nobody, don't you be a somebody. What am I saying? Don't be arrogant towards those who have just been corrected by heaven. If they humble themselves, broken, love them. God wants to restore. God wants to redeem. And the Lord can speed up time. He can redeem time. They can learn fast. I love one of the stories. I don't quite remember it, so anybody out there has got a better memory of this story that's out there. There was someone in some kind of command, and they wanted to know if God was with this person, and they went and told this person to go drive that Jeep or something out of the way. And he went and drove the Jeep out of the way, and all the people who commanded him got down to war the Lord. Why? Because there was no motive in the Jeep. Get on God. Get on Lord. Do what only you can do. Extraordinary miracle. Help. 
verse 10. Now verse 10 begins to switch it all up. Now we're going the other way. Now you followed my teaching, my conduct, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my perseverance. Wow. How many of us can associate with any of that? The move of God is going to expose us. But there's a contrast that he's going to use to expose it by. And that's the real. The true are going to be known by what they go through. How many of y'all have gone through anything? <laughs> you know, boy, going through stuff is awesome. It's your training ground. Makes the difference between somebody in the army and someone who's a SEAL, who's a ranger, who's a Green Beret. Training is everything. And Paul was saying, choose godliness, choose holiness before the Lord. How? By having faith, by having patience, by having love, by having endurance. I've had to endure quite a bit and had to love in the process. Y'all would be surprised who your pastor is, although Betty and maybe Sally and others, maybe Anita, I can't remember how far back this testimony goes by of my early days and my very first girlfriend. If y'all were to hear the truth of Seymour, and what that was like, it's like, oh God, I don't know if I want you to have my, I don't want It was bad. Not because I chose, because I got set up by hell and I didn't have Jesus on the inside. I got placed into a situation where I was trying to be responsible for a girl like she was my wife. Only when it's just a girlfriend, you can't, because there's no authority from heaven to do so. And it went stop. Now, sometime I'll tell you that story, but I don't want to take away from the message this morning. So then, verse 11, persecutions and sufferings were happening to Paul. What? Suffering? The fellowship of his suffering. A new place, me and God. We didn't take anything for it. I'm praying none of you have to learn it. I'm praying I'm learning it for all of us and that God would be satisfied with me learning it. I tell you, it's a rough place. I've had the whole faith for three years. Not let it waver. We're talking about not a night, not a day, not an hour. I won't say a minute, because there are plenty of times when you get hit. Amen. But you have to take the hit, go through the other side, and come back standing on faith ground. The doctors are amazed. My tumor never went anywhere at all. Never entered the lymph nodes. Never invaded any of the body whatsoever. God said, so you want to hit Seymour? Okay. This far and no more. Now, if I hadn't have held by faith, it might have gone into the lymph nodes. And I'd be done for. Y'all would have visited my gravesite. By the way, I want all those who love me, if you happen to be there, you're going to have to live a long life now, because I'm going to live to be 120. But if you happen to be there, I'm down below in the dirt in a body that does not have a soul, because my soul just went on the heavens ground with my Lord and my King and my God, who is my older brother, God the Lord himself. 
Yeshua Yahweh. Huh. He's got his father's last name. My son, I'm saying my father's last name is me. I'm going to get a ring one day when I can afford it for my son. And inside, it will be this. Joseph Henry Anderson, Cook God Jesus. What? Yeah. Joseph Henry Anderson, Cook Yahweh Jesus. That's their name. Did you get baptized into his name? Well, his name is what you live for, not your name. That's the whole crux of Christianity. So then, I think I gotta hurry. I think y'all are telling me, don't get lost anymore. I won't. Here we go. Persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, Weisberg, what persecutions I endured, out of them all the Lord rescued me. That's a marvelous thing to have persecution and the Lord comes and rescues you. It's not pleasant at the time. But the rescue of the Lord gives you a training ground you could not have any other way. It's what I, I you heard me say this before. You need to have it inside of you in whatever way you want. If I'm on a mountaintop experience with God, and God the Father shows me the next valley, I'm going to the valley. I'm coming off the mountaintop experience, and I'm going to the valley. Why? Because it's got a higher mountain than the one I'm on once I get to it. I want all of God. I don't care what I gotta go through. I want the Lord. That needs to be every disciple's heart. What's your will, Father? May it be done in my life this day. In Jesus' name. So then, there's going to be, if you're on Paul's team, if you're on the good side of 2 Timothy, the third chapter, there's going to be persecution and suffering. What? Sorry, it's coming. One of the proofs you're on the right team. Hell won't leave you alone. Good. Y'all have heard me say it before. You might not have understood it. I'd rather see you walk through that door with a little bit of sadness on your face. About what you're going through. Why? Well, you're in the valley of the next mountain top higher than the one you just came off of. Get on God. Verse 12. Look at closely at verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Get them, Lord. Lead on. I have a prayer. Y'all have heard me say it before. Father, forgive me for my lust of my flesh, my lust of my eyes, my pride of my life, my way and my deed. Cleanse me from it all, Father. Empower me for every, me and you, God. And I've got a condensed version of that. Father, I love you, Lord. Always tell the Lord I love you. If I don't, if I pray this without telling him I love you, I missed it. And Lord, Holy Spirit, correct me. Lord, I love you. Forgive me for my, cleanse me from all, empower me for every. Me and you, God. Here we go. But I used to have a prayer that that one replaced. That was my first prayer. Lord God, Overshadow me, undergird me, and camp round about, Lord God, and lead on. Overshadow me, Father, undergird me, Lord God, and camp round about me. I'm completely enclosed in God. Now let's go. 
where you want to go about what you want to do. Let me tell you, the Lord will put you in some situations that are scary, but God's with you. I'm going to be in some scary situations. I don't care. Why? I'm hanging out with God. My enemies who think that they are more powerful than me, which they are, are in trouble because I'm hanging out with God. You want to hang out with the Lord. It don't matter what's coming. God's got it. So then, verse 13, but evil men and imposters. Now that's in the house. This whole thing is in the house. Wish it were the world. It's not. It's in the house. But evil men and imposters. There is a riot of a prophecy that is out there. I would send it to you, but it's almost one of those things. You, if I send this to you and y'all think this is normal, Betty will hate this thing. I mean, this thing is ribald. But there's a guy who's a prophet, but I believe his message. And he's talking about fire from God coming to the anal area of the whole homosexual experience out there. You ought to hear his prophecy. Now, how many of y'all are brave enough for us to send this to you? Knowing that I live a godly life, and I'm not trying to send you ungodliness, but it's going to sound pretty ribald. How many of you want me to send this to you? Alright. We're going to send it so Linda and Julian and the rest of y'all just buckle your seat. It'll catch up to you. And Sally. Amen. And I'm telling you, this is a rob all. Oh my. Yeah, Kareem, you'll have to answer because I can't quite hear it. Yeah, right. yeah. But the message is the Lord. You know, there's a place where I know to engage in a level of conversation that most people don't want to go, go to. But that's for another day. So then, there's a contrast to our contrast. Right now, you're called to walk a the walk. And you've got a contrast out there. You got somebody out there in the body that does not look like you. And they are successful, and in their eyes, you are not. Oh my. Evil peoples and imposters will flourish, deceiving and being deceived. So I want to make a U-turn with those who are godly, those who are his, the remnant that runs the race and wins it. I want to hang with them. How about you? I want you to listen to something that Daniel said. Out of the 12th chapter. Now at that time, Michael, and listen, I keep promising you that we're going to pray the message. But what happens is it takes diaphragm to accent the word. And I'm in pain the whole time I'm ministering to you up here. But I'm not letting that stop me because I'm going to give you the best. If a word needs accent, I'm going to accent it. And you understand this? Wow, he was just hit my scary face. Hey, get going. Get on, John. Get on, Lord. Now, at that 
that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress. We just read what the end house was going to look like. Can you imagine what the world's going to look like when the house doesn't have any salt? Wow. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. <laughs> oh, no. That's why I think you're a rapture teacher. Don't forget 2 Thessalonians, second chapter. By the time you think you got it in, I'll show you another scripture that'll take it one deeper. Why? Wow. Just spend a second on the rapture. No man knows the hour or the day. Quit trying to figure it out and get to work in the kingdom. You will not figure out the rapture. Why? Because God. All scripture agrees with all scripture. God put in his word. No man will not know the hour of the day. You won't figure it out. By the time you figure it out and have all the scriptures lined up, there'll be one scripture that'll tell you different. So whether it's pre, post, or mid, get busy in the kingdom. So then, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awaken. <laughs> These to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And I can teach you this and teach you how Daniel is spanning oversights of epochs and times when each of these verses. But I want you just to listen to the next verse. That's where we've been headed. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars are heaven and heaven. I'm going with God. How about you? Would you stand? Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Now listen closely to what I'm going to tell you. Because this prophetic understanding. When the glory of the Lord hits, you want to be here. If for some reason, you are not here that day. I have to prophetically take note of it. Can you understand that? I have to. And then I have to look at you as if God the Father's got a certain training ground that you got to go through before he's going to release anything to you. Because those who are here that day are going to have the glory of the Lord arise upon you. Rise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Be fair in Jesus' name. Would you bow your head with me? I'm just going to pray a short prayer. Sometimes short prayers are wonderful. I don't know how short short it is, so hang. <laughs> Father, Lord, I've delivered your word gently because hearts are able to hear. Lord, it's so wonderful to hear. Lord, it's so wonderful to have a heart that receives. It's so wonderful not to have an evil conscience, but to have a sprinkling of your blood, Jesus, upon our conscience. A washing our bodies with your water, Lord, this day. So, Father, Lord, your life has
have got to shine out of us. Lord, I repent of any false light of me. No Seymour light. Your light, Jesus. Your light, Father. Your light, Lord, Holy Spirit. Sir. Out of us. In Jesus' holy name. We look to you, Lord. We bow our knee. Bow our hearts. Surrender our minds. Surrender our emotions, our will, our soul. And Father, we pick up our cross and follow you. Amen. Jesus. Lord God. Amen. Thank you guys for coming. What a marvelous day in the first church. See you whenever there's the next time. Amen.